Uh, hi, everybody. This is Meredith White. I want to thank you so much for joining us for the second webinar in the Nikan Industry Webinar Series. Uh, this series is generally designed to share information on how changes to coastal ecosystems, including ocean acidification, are affecting the aquaculture and fishing industries. And today, we're veering away a little bit from a focus on ocean acidification and considering the general changes to coastal ecosystems that are affecting both aquaculture and wild harvest industry members. So today we'll hear from Sana Chamberlain and Hannah Pearson from the Island Creek Hatchery in Duxbury, Massachusetts about flooding issues that they've seen, and also from DJ King about his transition from wild harvest to sea farming in Long Island Sound. So each presentation today will be 15 to 20 minutes with a joint question and answer, answer session at the end. And there is a question box in the uh, panel on the right hand side of your screen where you can submit questions. You can submit questions uh, throughout the webinar and then we'll address them all during the question and answer period at the end. And so, to introduce our first presenters, um, as a lifelong ocean lover, Hannah Pearson earned her uh, BS in marine biology at Roger Williams University in Rhode Island. That's where she began her oyster career. She worked at the Luther H. Blunt Shellfish Hatchery on the Roger Williams campus for a few years during college. She learned about the spawning and rearing processes for oysters, clams, and scallops. And all of the projects uh, were focused on local restoration and research efforts. Hannah then began at Island Creek Oysters in 2013, shortly after she graduated, and moved into commercially producing oyster seed for Skip Bennett. The Island Creek Hatchery spawns and rears oysters, hard clams, surf clams, and bay scallops, all for their own shellfish farm, and now beginning to get into seed sales. So Hannah has been with Island Creek for five years. Fauna Chamberlain began culturing microalgae seven years ago in the marine lab at Roger Williams University, so where she was also uh, pursuing a BS in marine biology and a minor in aquaculture and aquarium science. She cultured live beads and tropical fish and also conducted research. After graduation, Shauna spent a few years in different jobs throughout the industry, from an aquarium to a cancer zebrafish facility, searching for her preferred area in aquaculture. Ultimately, her position at Roger Williams, culturing different species of mollusks, led to her love for shellfish larvae. So she made the switch from fish to bivalves when an opportunity at Island Creek Oysters opened up three seasons ago. So we'll start with their uh, presentation, and afterwards I will introduce DJ King, and we will have his presentation, and then the question and answers. All right, can everyone hear us? Meredith, can you yeah. hear us? We're having a little issues with the mute, yeah. unmute. I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. So um, today we wanted to talk about our flooding experiences that happened in Duxbury this winter. We um, have experienced flooding before at our hatchery. We've been in the same facility for about seven years now and back in, it was either 2013 or 2014, we had about four inches of water in our hatchery just from one random winter storm. Um, but this year we experienced two flooding events um, in January and March. So this presentation is going to talk about um, what we experienced, the hardships that it created for our farm, um, and kind of moving forward how we're going to combat this issue. So for those of you who don't know where we are, um, we are on the south shore of Massachusetts. Um, the town is called Duxbury, where we're within Cape Cod Bay. Um, so the close-up photo kind of shows you that we are protected by the arm um, of the bay. Um, so we're not completely exposed to the ocean. Um, in Duxbury, we experience 10 to 12 foot tides regularly. So it's a pretty big tidal change. Um, so again, in our in our flooding events in January and March, um, we not only had the 
um, storm surge from uh, the blizzards that were coming through, but we were in our astronomically higher tide times anyway. Um, and our hatchery is actually located uh, probably about 100 feet from the bay. So we are already in a iffy location. Um, and we actually just found out that it is probably the lowest point on um, a quarter mile stretch of our waterfront in Duxbury. So this is just a graph that the National Weather Service put out um, that shows the mean higher high water of the tides that we ended up experiencing and compares them to any high tides that we've had um, and flooding that we've had over a period of time. So up until this January, our the most flooding we had ever had was from um, back in 1978 when there was a blizzard. Um, and just to kind of explain the mean higher high water, um, MHHW and MLLW are both terms that describe the extra tidal water levels, um, which is describing the that there are vertical limits of the predicted tide on a tide table, and any time that that water level increases to above the predicted, it's called an extra tidal water level. So, um, in 1978. The MLLW was 15.1 feet, and in January 2018, um, by the time the peak was reached, we were at 15.16 feet MLLW. So that's just saying that we ended up surpassing that highest um, level. And uh, the graph, when this was published, it wasn't at the highest point, so it kind of shows um, a lower level but that was just because uh, it was published before the flooding reached its max um, and this is depicting the boston tides but residents were definitely shocked because this hasn't happened since 1978 and over a two-month span we had two different storms that um, caused significant flooding um, all right. Oh, and one other thing about the graph, sorry. The blue line is the line showing the predicted tide. So that's predicted out years in advance. And then the red line is the preliminary observed tide. So the actual tide that's um, occurring. So in January, January 4th, 2018, was when we had the first flood. And this flood was, um, it was 23 inches, so just under two feet, and we weren't prepared for it at all. Um, we didn't see it forecasted um, to be as uh, impactful as it was, and we ended up having some damage to different pumps that we have throughout the facility that we actually had secured to the wall, and there wasn't any means of easily removing them from the system that they were plumbed to and some of those pumps did get submerged and had to be replaced. Um, there were a was a lot of damage and moving around of supplies because we didn't secure anything down. Um, we had tanks and materials that were lifted and kind of moved throughout the hatchery. And we have um, raceways um, for stacked up raceways for our demolish systems. And the flooding was so significant that it ended up filling that bottom raceway of our systems. Um, luckily, January is the beginning of our spawning season, so it didn't really uh, affect our downwaller tanks as much as it would have if we had animals in those systems at that time. And this is just a photo kind of showing the chaos. Um, it definitely took a few days to clean everything up and took us away from our work for those three days to get everything just set back up so that we could continue our normal hatchery work. So in, in March, um, I think all of Boston um, now knew that another flooding event was coming. Um, it was much more broadcasted on the news um, and in all, on, on all the weather channels. Um, this one was a pretty big storm. Um, basically all of the South Shore flooded every single um, town on the water. 
Um, however, the flooding was only about 18 inches. We were a little less, um, but it did flood three separate times. Um, so it was a longer duration of a storm and um, having the astronomically high tides. Um, in surrounding towns, they actually had um, a, a, up to eight tides that flooded areas um, where people live around here. And then it even took eight more tides um, to get back to a normal tide cycle. So all of these, this uh, high water was hanging around from the existing storm surge. Um, so basically it took about 16 tides to get rid of this storm and get it through. Um, so it was kind of a long week, but in the hatchery specifically, we were able to get a lot of prep work done. Um, we are in the midst of our spawning at this time. So we had oysters in the hatchery. Um, we were able to, you know, secure anything, move stuff off the ground, um, you know, trying to keep things sterile in the hatchery environment. Um, we redesigned a lot of systems to have them function on alternate reservoirs, um, you know, to have a, a higher reservoir tank. And we were able to actually fill our water storage tanks before the storm, um, prepping to make sure we didn't get that churned up water into our uh, larval systems. And we were able to just move any loose equipment. We had already replaced about a couple thousand dollars worth of pumps from the first storm, so we didn't want that um, to happen again. And then with our staff here, we were able to alternate the larval work schedule, um, you know, 3, 4 a.m. start times to get stuff done before this storm hit. Um, it was three separate um, tide cycles. So this is actually a door in our hatchery where we were able to mark on the left hand side. You see 1 4 2018. That's that 23 inch mark. Um, for the January storm and then the three tide cycles in March's storm. Um, and we actually stayed here during the March storm because we were actually kind of worried about how high it was actually going to go. The, the forecasters really couldn't predict what the exact storm surge was going to be. So we just waited it out. Um, and it was a little less, but like I said, we were in full hatchery mode. So um, we had extension cords and power strips hanging from the ceilings um, because I should mention during most of this storm we had no power. Um, we lost power quite frequently during um, the hatchery season so uh, that was we were also running a generator that was suspended off the ground um, and trying to get through the water to fill the generator to continue running our system. So um, March's storm was a little bit more stressful. Um, you know, we had a lot of production that we had to take care of and make sure it was safe. So um, I don't, I'm not sure if that video came through or not. Um, it's a little spotty on our end. We're sorry about that. But um, that video is basically showing um, on our new property, uh, we were videoing the water coming up. Um, that is not our new hatchery, thank goodness, but it is um, one of the buildings on our property. So we're kind of taking into consideration what this flood looks like for our new property, which we'll get into in a minute. So another thing that we had to take into consideration when thinking about the flooding and all these big storms is what water quality param parameters we currently measure, how consistent they are, and what the potential impacts could be if something like this does happen again, happens more frequently. Um, so as of right now, we only generally monitor pH, salinity, and temperature. Um, and we mostly monitor them when we have an issue within the hatchery. So if our algae cultures start crashing, our larvae isn't growing well, um, we go back and check uh, to see that those parameters are online. And we do kind of know what our general um, normals are, but we're definitely looking into becoming more serious with our monitoring and hopefully be able to monitor more parameters, do them more consistently, and do them before we have an issue so that when we, um, when a storm or something happens, we can easily compare the, um, the, what our general norms are to anything that could be happening. 
Um, we've also started looking into some uh, data provided by the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. Um, they have a device out on one of the um, farms in Duxbury Bay that collects different water quality parameters. And um, we actually have access to that data from, um, I think, the past four years. And we're looking into that to see if there are any patterns, any um, changes over the years that um, could hopefully help us get a better baseline of uh, what our normals are, where we're starting from. Um, and we do, like Hannah mentioned, try to fill our water storage tanks from the bay uh, before large rainfalls. Uh, we don't want to have any salinity issues and as well as when there's a big storm, that means we end up having to filter the water um, a lot more than normal, takes longer, go through more filters, it's uh, not as clean. And that can always cause issues with um, our seed and larvae. So in terms of the new hatchery, we um, have a few things that we're taking into consideration. We definitely want to do more regular water quality monitoring get some more parameters um, and, like I said, kind of get a baseline of what our normals are, if our normals are changing, being able to track that. Um, equipment placement is going to be huge. Being able to have pumps that can be removed if they need to be um, from the system that they are plumbed to and having them at a better placement so that if there were to be a flood, um, they wouldn't necessarily get submerged. Uh, we also have two outdoor outboiler systems uh, that currently, when we were in the old hatchery, lived right, um, right next to the water um, on the other side of the building between our hatchery and the bay. And we need to consider where we're going to put those uh, going forward with our new property, especially since we saw how it flooded during uh, the March floods and as well as any outdoor storage and um, unsecured materials that we have. Uh, during the March storm, we did go down to the uh, campus to see where the flood line was um, and so that we had a better idea of where to kind of set things up in case there was an issue. So uh, the hatchery itself is pretty far away from where that flood line is. So we're hopefully going to be uh, a little better off from the get-go. Um, so a little bit about our farm and uh, the damage that they experienced uh, this winter. Um, March, the, the March flood was the one that really affected um, all of our farms and gears. Luckily, in the winter, we have all of our gear out of our water, um, you know, no trays um, in the water. Um, however, they all are all stored on land. So the top photo is showing um, Duxbury Bay, and there is um, the peninsula of Duxbury Beach that kind of curves around Clarks Island. Um, that out on the tip of that is called Saquish, and that is where we have uh, one of our farms. Um, and everything for that farm gets pulled out of the water and put on land. Now this peninsula was completely submerged in March, um, and not only were we fighting high tides, but we were fighting cold temperatures. So a lot of the water actually froze around our gear um, and then carried it out um, to random places uh, in Duxbury, either along the beach um, or on Saquish itself. So we were dealing with the high tides, winds, and ice. Um, we did have a little bit of gear damage. Um, mostly we just had to track it all down. Um, a lot of, I, I would say Island Creek was pretty lucky in this storm. Um, some of the other farmers who either had gear in the water or, you know, had other gear stored on land, it ended up everywhere. For months, people were tr trying to track down their oyster grows and um, figure out what was theirs um, and what was still missing. Um, it is actually hard to say. Um, if you know how much product we lost. Um, we've talked to Skip about uh, what the farm experienced in these storms and um, it, he said it was difficult to quantify the loss. So it's a good thing we didn't, you know, we don't see a huge um, decrease in product, but we wanna make sure that 
um, you know, those are protected, but it's kind of out of, out of our control during these floods. Um, the bottom picture is um, at our new campus where our new hatchery is going to be. Um, that was during one of the March storms. You can just see the waves lapping up on um, our platform there. That is our oyster plex that is out of the water for the winter. However, what we want to point out is this entire waterfront right now it is a, a working platform for us. So we have seed graders down there, upwellers, um, you know, ADPI bag storage, everything's down there. So uh, we kind of put it down there to use this summer, but for this winter, we're gonna have to consider if it's gonna flood like that again and waves crashing on the shore, like in the video we played, um, we're gonna have to kind of re reevaluate our storage and, um, you know, if we can place upwellers there, if it's a safe area. Um, so normally we would say, you know, it wouldn't happen again, um, but we had two um, incidents within just a few months. And I think the kicker was that we kept talking to more and more people who've lived in Duxbury forever and that they hadn't seen anything since the 70s quite this bad. Um, so after the first time we said, OK, maybe it's every 30 years. Um, but then when it happened again in March, I think we got a little bit more serious about kind of wondering what's going on um in our environment and then how can we prepare for the next one and how is it going to affect us in the coming years um it it was definitely it's an unfortunate thing to have the flooding happen but for us it definitely happened at a ideal time in the sense that we had just got a new property that we could check out the flood line and kind of before we had started uh, figuring out where the new hatchery was going to go, how everything was going to be situated. Um, so it's hard that it happened, but we're moving to a new hatchery. We're in the process of it right now. So um, in the end, it was good. It pointed out a lot of things that we can take with us to the new hatchery to help us plan out where things are going to go and how uh, we can prevent further damage. And that's it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Hannah and Shauna. So we're going to transition to our second presentation now. This will be from Don King, also known as DJ King. He began uh, lobstering and fishing in 1969 when he was 10 years old. He graduated from Clark University, majoring in economics and geography. Uh, DJ has a 50 ton captain's license and is the owner of DJ King Lobsters and the captain of the 42 foot lobster boat, Corey Alexander. He has captains clam boats, oyster boats, and tugboats. In 2007, DJ began farming oysters and opened the Montuese Bay Oyster Company. He has also recently started farming seaweed. And we'll hear about this uh, progression in his presentation. Thanks so much. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, we got to go back here. Okay, um, can everyone see the screen? Uh, I started off lobstering in 1969, and uh, my story, unlike uh, the story you just heard with the hatchery just a couple of years my uh, story spans six decades and um, uh, Don may I ask you to take just a, a moment I cannot see your screen and I'm not sure if other people are having that problem as well uh, we will try to figure this out hold on it says showing main screen Ah, there it is. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much for waiting. We're all set. Okay, good. Um, as I was saying, uh, I had lobstered and since a, since a young boy here in Long Island Sound, and the times there are changing is what this is all about, I believe. Um, now, I located in Brantford, Connecticut, and um, I did go to college to Clark University, majored in economics and geography. 
I have a captain's license, um, and I captain a 42-foot lobster boat. I've done clam boats, oyster boats, tug boats, and uh, have just started doing some seaweed and also uh, oyster farming. Okay, now back in the 70s, that's a picture of me and um, when the pots were wood and men were steel. I'm no longer too much of a steel guy because I'm gotten a little on in age. But anyway, that's what we used to use for our pots, wooden old pots with barnacles on them. And uh, those pots used to catch a lot of lobsters. Okay, this is lobstering in its peak um, in 1998. Um, in the small area right around Brantford, we had 24 full-time lobstermen, and there's almost 27,000 pots out there. Um, and today, we're down to three part-time guys that are lobstering and do other things. Um, and one of the things that you see this picture here is um, we, we no, no one ever really liked to talk about what they caught because fishermen always had, were secretive about their catches. In, um, to avoid other fishermen going into their areas. And if somebody asked me how we did today, I would have said it was just an okay day, even though we caught 17 totes of lobster, over 1,500 pounds. And that's, that was lobstering really at its best. Okay, so we had big changes. Uh, in 1998, there was a, uh, a huge lobster die-off. Um, it was what I call uh, the straws that broke the camel's back. There were three main reasons. We had uh, a big hurricane, and um, there was a lot of it was a lot of rain, but not as much wind from Hurricane Floyd, and it washed the chemicals into the sound, which what they were uh, when they were tr trying to uh, kill the mosquitoes to prevent the spread of the West Nile virus. Um, the, the lobsters were coming up dead in the traps. It was also due to warmer water. We had a warmer water conditions that year, which continued until 2014. And this, this, this might have been the end for the lobsters in Long Island Sound. So we were, this is a picture of us hauling the empty traps. So after the die-off, lobster pots were coming up empty, and this was a huge shock for the people that were in the industry. We went from pots being full pretty much, you know, right near land where you can see this picture, we're very close to the rocks, and um, both the lobsters and the lobster men have become an endangered species out there. In 2016, we had some good news. We had uh, two consecutive years of colder water and higher egg production, and this was good for the lobster fishery. And you can see here is a picture of uh, us catching some some pretty decent um, catches of lobsters. But unfortunately, there was decline in both 2017 and so far in 2018 is another bad year. So. Um, this isn't something that I would advise anybody to get in, getting into right now at this time. Okay, so this is one of the one of the problems here is um, we've had some huge striped bass population move in, um, and here was a a, a uh, huge striper, and believe it or not, inside this striper was a pound and a quarter lobster. And it's not the only time we've heard stories about lobsters being in, caught in stripers. There's um, been stories where the people catch the lobster. They have, not only do they have the catch the fish, not only do they eat the fish, but they also get a lobster bonus dinner. So um, that was uh, that's one of the big predators of the lobster. Um, and here's another. Um, picture of the sporgies. Now, um, due to the new deep regulations, um, which I guess I got to talk about the regulations a little bit here because it's something that we're always fighting. We do realize that there has to be regulations in the industry and some of the regulations are very good. 
but some things get bogged down by the process and uh, there's there's fish teeming with fish out here right now uh, and these porgies love small lobsters and they eat them like candy and they had done a study up in Maine where they tethered lobsters with fishing line to a table on the seafloor and they watched them peck them off one by one. Uh, another fierce uh, predator, and they have these, this is a huge um, fishery in Cape Cod Bay up there, um, is the sea bass. But it's a double-edged sword with these sea bass because this year we probably, our value, our catch value in sea bass was probably higher than our catch value in lobsters, believe it or not. And we got up to 675 for the big fish this year. Um, so they also have regulated us way back on these, and we realize that there's there has to be regulations, but I think they have gone a little overboard with, with some of this stuff. Also, the totog, another valuable fish. They also eat lobsters, and they've uh, they've made a pretty significant comeback in the area. So the lobsters kind of got it, um, not only do they have all the environmental issues, they also have all these predators that are that are trying to eat them up. And here's a, I, this, actually this guy's name is Richard King, and some people think that it's me, but, um, and I say this because years being a lobsterman, people have had a mystique and a romance with the, with the lobstermen. And there's not that much when you're a winkle, catching winkle or catching finfish or doing oyster farming. And um, this was a pretty good book. And I thought that uh, if anyone was interested in reading it, uh, it would be a good read. Okay, so there's a picture of our boat. And we had to make changes. We, we couldn't continue on. We lost so many guys to the industry. And fortunately, uh, I had foresight or for some reason, I started to do other things ahead of a lot of the other guys. Like I said, just in this area, we had 27 and we're down to three and all three guys uh, diversified. So here comes the, the comeback of the wooden pots from 1970 until now we're starting to pull wooden pots again. Um, so with no lobsters to catch, we had to look for other ways to make livings, and we began conching, or uh, what they say is winkling. Uh, they're, they're a warmer water species. They're able to tolerate warmer water, and lobsters was one of their big uh, predators, and now that the lobsters were gone, they were able to flourish. Very, very diversified, the almighty conch. So the conch or winkles had saved our fishing industry, at least in the short term. Uh, it was very little known about this animal, but it was very tolerant to temperature and salinity changes. I did some of my, uh, some of my tests on my own. Uh, they lived up for a month out of the water, uh, six months in stagnant water, uh, and they're, they're fierce. They're, they look like a slow-moving snail, but when they want to, they really go after food. And the sales and demand for the conch was years ago was just tied to the local economy. And now it, uh, with the opening of the Chinese market, uh, the prices were allowed to skyrocket. So it was diversica diversification or bust. And now you can see on this, this normal day, you can see that all the different types of gear we have on board. We have lobster pots, we have wooden winkle pots, we have gill nets. Um, and underneath there, you can even see some oyster cages too. So we had to do other things. And so this is what we did. Um, now, this was how we started our oysters in um, Upwellers. And uh, it was a good way to uh, tie your boats up, make a nice night, and they look like docks, but underneath the, uh, the oysters were able to grow, and in a three-month growing season, we got our oysters to grow about to an inch and a half, 
Um, the water flows up through the silos of the oysters, and it brings a lot of food and makes them grow fast. Here's some select farm-raised oysters. They're, uh, it's different from the wild oysters. They're all uh, almost identical, and uh, you don't have to chip them. Uh, so uh, they can go right to market once they get to about a year and a half old. We can get up to market. Okay, so we had um, a lot of traps. We had almost 3,000 traps, and we had nothing. We, we couldn't figure out. We had to figure out other things to do with the traps. So we started uh, putting oyster bags on top of the traps like this and setting them out in trawls. Uh, and this is one of them. And there's you can see a little bit of the following and the growth of this uh, red seaweed, which we had problems with. Okay, so um, in 2015, uh, we had su super cold winter, um, and the temperatures were recorded um, in, uh, at 29 degrees. The temp water temperature was 29 degrees for 12 days, and under 30 degrees for 45 straight days. And fish, uh, it was a big issue for us, uh, both for the oyster farms uh, and the traps we had out. And here's some, uh, I, I, I tried to find out how oysters lived and how they uh, survived in ice. And I, so I did some of my own experiments. And this is some of the stuff that I found out that um, temperatures of seven degrees, uh, they, they would live for four hours uh, inside the bags of cages. And what happens is the reason why is the temperature drops, there's a thin layer and it forms around the cages, and it eventually becomes a solid block of ice. And they were able to stay in these bags and these solid blocks of ice for 40 days, and were still able to. Uh, they were still they were still alive, which is uh, pretty amazing. So the oysters were tolerant to wild uh, the wild fluctuations of the weather that we have today. Now here's a picture of uh, a, one of my wild oyster beds. Um, and you talk about like high water and big storms, and um, this is what it looked like after uh, one of the hurricanes. So the, the, the huge storms can cause destruction to both the farm uh, raised oysters and to the also to the wild oysters. And I always think of it as nowadays these storms are the energy gets built up in the water and then it gets released like a coiled spring and it's just the storms have become more violent and more frequent frequent and the oysters here have all been silted over another picture of the same spot there and you see there's no oysters left there at all okay so we also did wild seed oystering it's the first time we've we've traveled a lot of different routes and um we started this new venture with um we were we were seeding wild oysters we were taking the seeds out of the Housatonic River in Stratford at that time we used a special drag which uh, a dredge and catch the wild seeds and then we put them in put them on uh clean uh oyster beds and in this picture you can see the huge pile of oysters that's on the boat and um one of the guys enjoying the day. Um, so here's pictures of uh, kelp, which we've also diversified into. And the kelp is strung on lines and then hung in the water. It's pretty basic and pretty easy. I always tell people the most important thing about this is when you come back, it's usually set this off in uh, November. And when you come back, in the spring, if it's still there, that's very good. That's very successful. And here's some pictures of some uh, kelp hanging off the lines. Um, this is some of the kelp uh, from this past year. We didn't have as good results. Uh, I, I'm really not sure why, but um, 
you can see the kelp actually it tastes tremendous and it's good raw and you cook it up it's kind of like um it's kind of like spinach i tell people like kind of like salty spinach <laughs> uh another seaweed was grassalaria um there's notice on this there's uh no it's kind of a hard picture but it's uh there's no marine growth um this seaweed flourishes in the warm summer months but unfortunately at this time uh i haven't found really a commercial use for it but it does it's another seaweed that does taste great we also get gillnet fishing and we found that with the warmer waters uh the sharks began showing up in the net we had tiger sharks um also large gator bluefish a lot of sea trout weak fish codfish and also with all this uh fish around we had the, one of the largest seal populations ever in long island sound and the seals are very smart they never get stuck in the net and they they kind of look at you, peck a couple fish, stick their nose up, and say thank you very much. So uh, they're funny, funny animals. And here's one of the deckhands that has a dusky shark. And we never had seen these. Um, and people are always asking me, you know, what can I do? What, you know, what is there anything that I can do? And a couple little things that. Um, I think that are easy is pesticides and fertilizers. They never should apply this stuff before the rain. Uh, one gallon of weed killer poured in a pond of salt water the size of the Astrodome will kill everything in it. So this stuff's deadly. And uh, you can go into a, uh, into a big store and you'll see rows and rows of this stuff. And... Uh, what I say, whatever goes on the ground eventually ends up in the sound. And clear doesn't always mean clean. How long do you think a goldfish would last in a bottle, uh, in a glass of vodka? Not too long. So, uh, anyway, the future here for us is, is still very uncertain. Um, due to these wild climate fluctuations, the water quality, the unpredictable forces of nature, the lobsters may never flourish here in Long Island Sound. Therefore, it's necessary for us to pursue other options. Sea farming, conching, fin fishing, oystering may be our ticket to the future. I've been very fortunate to uh, do what I love fishing my whole life. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, DJ. So now we're going to open up the question and answer period. And we already have a set of questions that have already been submitted. Um, you can find the question box on the right-hand panel so that you can also submit questions. Uh, so I, we, our first question is from Frank Teller. Uh, this was for Hannah and Shauna's presentation. And the question is, uh, is this based on main geological service predictions of ocean rises? So because this question was submitted during the presentation, I'm going to ask uh, Frank to clarify what this was referring to, although I think it is the title chart that they showed towards the beginning. Um, Frank, could you please uh, clarify that in the question box? And we'll come back to your question uh, once I see that clarification. So moving on to the next question, we have a series of questions from Dwight Gledhill at the NOAA Ocean Acidification Program office. Also for Shauna and Hannah, did you experience any poor water quality conditions in the Bay for a period following the flooding events? If so, did it create further challenges even after the floods? So we, um, I think, actually got a little lucky. We didn't experience any type of poor water quality after. Um, we kind of made sure to just extra, extra filter our water. Um, and by that, I mean our, our series of filters is a sand filter, um, three series of uh, sock filters, and then a carbon filter. Um, so it normally goes through that, and we just wanted to make sure that we gave it extra time on the sock filters to just get rid of anything that um, 
was in that water. But as for our algae quality and the growing the larvae in it, um, everything grew fine. Um, so we assume that we didn't have any type of issues, at least, you know, that our, our uh, organisms needed to survive in. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Dwight, is there currently an established water quality monitoring station within the Bay? And if so, who provides for it? And, and is the data of use to you? If the data is of use to you, in what ways? So um, we have been looking at the, the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension. They have um, a device that's out on one of the leases um, out on the Bay that has been out there collecting data for a few years now, and we have access to that. So what we've actually been doing is looking back at um, the data from previous years and comparing it to our um, larval data and seeing, because we have had um, some random times that our larvae haven't been doing so well, um, uh, but, not related to the flooding event. Oh, yeah, yeah, not related to the flooding event, sorry. Just like throughout the years, like sometimes we'll have a batch of larvae that for some reason just aren't growing the way they should be. Um, and so we've been trying to look back at the, the data from years past that has been collected out on the bay, compare that to our hatchery data and see if there are any anything that lines up. Um, so far, we did notice um, one circumstance where there was a significant significant drop in salinity um, and it also occurred around the time that we had a larval die off uh, but we're not sure if it was the cause of it we're just kind of looking back into um, just seeing how those correlate and kind of going from there great thank you and then uh how many farms of the kind, uh, okay, so it says, how many farms of this kind currently operate around Duxbury Bay? There are about fi around 15 different farms in Duxbury Bay, um, you know, with all, all with different leases, Island Creek, you know, just being one of them. Okay, great, thank you. And then, uh, okay, we have a question from Katie O'Brien Clayton. Thanks for a great presentation. Can you talk about what would have happened if the flooding had occurred during the summer, if it were a hurricane, and how that would have affected your operation? So during the summer months, um, we, our, operate, our uh, hatchery is not operating. We usually um, close sometime in June or July, depending on the production that's needed. Um, for example, this year we were done the last week of June. Other years we've gone into August. Um, but now, uh, based on you know either summer storms that are ha happening or hurricanes, um, we usually worry about water quality that happens in the summer um, that doesn't allow us to grow larvae um, in the uh, hatchery. So that's also why we try to wrap up early. However, um, in the summer months, we are running our upwellers and, um, you know, both on land and underneath the dock as in a flupsy. So that is something that, you know, we deal with every summer. Those um, we have a southwest wind here that really affects um, the seed in the water. So we have to we have to, um, you know, pay attention to that in the summer months, but not necessarily flooding. Thank you. And now uh, Katie has a question for DJ. As the climate continues to change and Long Island Sound warms and pH and dissolved oxygen changes, what might happen to your operation? Uh, Branford has some of the best water quality in Long Island Sound with no hypoxia, low bacteria counts. What can DEEP and DA slash BA do to assist with water quality monitoring for our commercial op operations? And I would add to that question, uh, what are DA and BA? If, if you could answer that as well, DJ. Um, well, I think that uh, part of the water quality um, 
monitoring is done by uh, the state of Connecticut and um, down in Milford, Connecticut Aquaculture, Dave Carey's group. And I would say that they would probably, you know, need some more funding because they don't get it. They don't get enough people out to get, you know, after a rainstorm or something. It's very difficult for them to get there, to get out and uh, and monitor the different water conditions. And um, so I think that that would would help if they could uh, get a few more people online with them, uh, working with them. And um, also the kelp and some of the seaweed actually helps with lowering the nitrogen levels in, in uh, the area. We have, a, we have a really good upgraded sewer plant here in Brantford, and they say that the water that comes out of there, you can drink it. I'm not drinking it, but they can drink it. But anyway, um, so what was the other thing, DA and BA? Yeah, part, part of the question is, what can DEEP and DA slash BA do to assist with water quality monitoring? And I am just not familiar with what those acronyms stand for. So I wondered if oh, they were groups. That's Connecticut. That's DEEP. That's Connecticut um, Department of Environmental and Energy and Protection. So uh, they changed it from DEP to DEEP. So um, Okay. Yeah, and the other is, I think, what I talked about, Dave Carey's group over there at the Milford Aquaculture. Okay. So, and um, as, oh. go ahead. do you anticipate any changes in your current operations as Long Island Sound warms and pH and DO change? You know, I'm always, I'm always trying to hedge against the changes that we're seeing. Um, I just recently went swimming the other day and I could not believe how hot or warm the water was. It was almost getting into a jacuzzi and I'm not really sure why it, it was so warm and um, especially due to the fact that we had such cold water all spring long. And um, another interesting thing that I had just thought about was we always had at this time of the year a huge red jellyfish population that moved in. It, the swimmers hated them, but um, that's a huge change. We haven't seen one jelly yet this year. I mean, they used to get on the pots and on the lines and everything, and um, it, it's it's a change that, uh, you know, I don't know why um, it, it's like that, but it's a change. And we always got to think of other ways, of other things to do. That's why I, I tried some of that uh, the wintertime seed oystering. Uh, DJ, I have a question for you. I am wondering if you grow your kelp in close proximity to your oysters, and if so, have you noticed any changes in the oyster growth rates? Do you think that that might be beneficial? Um, the expert on this is Dr. Charlie Yarish uh, in Stanford, UConn Stanford, and um, he uh, says nothing but good things about this kelp. And uh, yes, we do grow the kelp and the oysters right on the same lot, which is about half a mile offshore here. Um, and uh, I'm not sure whether it, you know, may, I think the, the growth of the oysters is, is, you know, there's a lot of different factors and I, I'm sure it doesn't hurt, but the kelp is a great thing to have. It's, uh, and I know there's a lot of other people that are trying to get into the kelp right now. Um, like I said, it's a fairly easy thing to do. As you saw in one of those pictures, you just have a, a, a one single line and you roll the seed kelp out onto the line. We had trouble with our seed kelp this year, but um, in general, it's an easy thing to do. And I, you know, I think the more people that are going to involve with that, I think the better it's better for the environment. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, we have no more questions at this point. So I would like to thank Shauna and Hannah and DJ for presenting today. These were excellent presentations. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us today. The uh, webinar will be posted on the MECAN website, so you can go back to review it at a later time if you are interested. And thank you again. Have a wonderful afternoon.